imagine this you're heading out to the battlefield ready to come back impressing your wife your kids or maybe even your pet turtle and you're ready you're hyped knuckles cracked close off you're ready for this you've been training for this moment your entire life so you go in you assume the pre dump stance and you wait and you wait and you wait but nothing comes the nuke does not arrive the magician fails to show the magic trick yeah that's about how i felt with genshin impact simulanka event now i realize this is probably not the best analogy to use because it seems like i'm saying the event was shit or something no that what i just explained was my experience trying to finish the event again not because it was bad or something but because uh well yeah, I had 40 days to finish this event, it came down to the final one. So yeah, I think it's fair to say that I'm a little late to the party here, and by the time I'm recording this, Natlane's already out, so I do plan on making a review about that as well when I'm caught up in everything. Uh, but I just had to talk about this event, regardless if it's over or not, so yeah. Now the summer event is pretty much what you'd expect from seeing the trailers. It takes place in an origami storybook type setting created by the three witches of the Hexen Circle, that being Alice, which we all know well at this point and her daughter, the author of the book, and Mona's teacher, Barbara Loth. Right off the bat, anything involving the Hexen Circle has my interest peaked, because you know we're gonna get some juicy info out of them. Oh, you just know it. And boy, was I right. For days one and two of Simulanka, you know, it's your pretty average vacation stay, but things really start to ramp up once Wanderer came into play. And I just really love what they did with his character here, and his relationship with Durin, which was amazing, uh, which I will get to. But back to the witches for now, because I feel like this is where the real meat and potatoes of the quest lay. So up till now, the Hexen Circle have been shrouded in so much mystery that it's like they're a bunch of cryptics instead of characters. Every time they pop up, it's usually tied to some heavy lore drop, and we're left scratching our heads like, what the fuck are they? <laughs> who the fuck are these people? Okay, picture this. It's like, it's like seeing a red wall with a blue bucket of paint next to it. You see the end result of what happened? You don't know how the fuck it happened. You don't know how the, the blue smeared red on the wall. But you get the idea. And you see what happened. But you rarely ever get to see who actually did the painting. Like for the Hexen Circle, we see their final products. We see their creations. But we rarely ever get to know them as characters. Like are these guys actually friends? Or are they just a bunch of magic nerds with the same goal? But here I was pleasantly surprised to get a little bit more depth from them as characters. Alongside some funny interactions. Which did end up with us understanding their dynamics a lot better. By all rights, I should have been A, since A is the first and last letter of my name. But Alice overruled me on the basis of seniority and said I should be N instead because of my middle name. <laughs> she really knows how to push my buttons. It's not just about magic and mystery anymore. We're getting to see the human side and it's making everything a lot more interesting. Like, for example, we see Barbaloth show some actual concern for Anders' daughter and that mini Durin. That's some wholesome shit right there, bro. That's the kind of shit I want to see. It's so fulfilling when we actually get these little moments. But let's cut all the bullshit. Those were the potatoes. It's time for the real meat here, which were the lore drops. And bro, bro, the implications from the lore we got, it, it, it's just like, it's like a lore meteor, bro. It's like, the, the implications for this are so massive. It's like a... What can I compare it to? Like a black hole for your brain cells? But like, I'm going to try to unravel the spaghetti here. So we already know from Sumeru that Ermensol can basically erase everything into out of existence unless the info is preserved in some clever way, like some fantasy setup, such as uh, what Nahida did with Skaramush's memories. So when Mona drops the fact that this fantasy world is much like Tavat's a direct mirrored version, it's like... Hold up, what's really going on here? Because the Hexen Circle didn't just do this for kicks. There has to be an intention behind it. Some 40 chess move that we're not seeing. So if you look at the story of this event through that lens, we perceive it much, much differently. So for example, we have the Constellation Metropole portion of the story where we find these people whose lives are guided by predeterminations of the Goddess of Prophecy. So these people, they can reverse time if they get into trouble, but they can also get stuck because of it. Now, I think there's a few things here that it's hinting at. The first thing that comes to mind is obviously the Loom of Fate, and how it enables one to control the ley lines of Tavat, and thereby taking control of reality. Though, as Kari Baird mentioned, accessing the past may be impossible, shaping the present and future is more than enough to give rise to an authoritarian figure or force capable of mending the world to the will, much like how the freezing and rewind time magic is affecting the citizens of Simulanka. Though it could be foreshadowing the Abyss's usage of the Loom, it could also very well be about the present and Celestia. 
So by now, I'm sure that most people are aware that the sky of Tavad is fake. The fuck does that mean? Well, um, <laughs> your, your guess is as good as mine, to be honest, I don't really know. Uh, but I have a feeling it's some form of barrier, not a physical one, per se, but it could be like a magic barrier that maintains the balance of the world, while also preventing outsiders from interfering with Tavad. However, over time, I feel like this ancient protective magic has gradually been weakening, causing certain individuals to be frozen in time, while also giving openings for outsiders to come in. Perhaps this barrier was fueled by the people of Conria, and therefore the heavenly principles curse these individuals with immortality to ensure that they won't disrupt the cycle and endanger the entire world. Even if they sin, they still have their uses. Now I could very well be wrong here because I'm not a lore expert or something, I haven't read all the books and like have 50 fucking pages of lore diagrams and shit. No, I, I'm just throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks. So correct me if I'm wrong, I just thought it was a neat idea and I'm putting it out there, so yeah. Another interesting thing to come out of this whole Tabat mirroring Simulanka situation is that Anna Starter is the author of Simulanka. She is the author of the book. And we know she had a short lifespan. She passed on shortly after. So I'm wondering if that relates back to Celestia and the Heavenly Principles, because we know Heavenly Principles, Fanes, they're the creator of the world. So if that's a mirrored version, uh, well, we know that the Heavenly Principles have been asleep for 500 years since the Cataclysm. What if they're actually dead? and we're just left with the residues of their influence. I don't know, just some food for thought, but now I want to get back to Wander and Durin because I just love the way they were handled here. So basically, we learn in this event that in some point in the future, Durin will revive and has been in the process of reviving this entire time. Now will he be friend or foe? That remains to be seen, but if Simulanka is an indication of anything, it's that Wander will definitely play a big role in the future. And with the recent foreshadowing that Inazuma is going to war, it seems like some big big conflict is about to go down. But here's the twist. This time, we were not the main hero of the story. That spotlight was solely on the Wanderer. Instead, we were brought in as witnesses to the whole thing all thanks to Alice. Now what's interesting about that? is that Wanderer is the only character in the story so far to have their character demo voiced by Alice herself. <laughs> Boring clearly isn't my style, nor is it the Wanderer's way of doing things. You could say his story is simple and straightforward, or horrendously complex, and both would be right. It all depends on the storyteller. Are you sure it has to be me? <sighs> Fine, let's get this over with. Now, it could just be because he erased his Skarmouche self from the rest of the world, so nobody really knows who he is as the Wanderer, but it could also hold some significance to his role in the story. I mean, just the very fact that he's chosen as the hero of Tavat in the Simulanka version of the story tells me that his character will be much more important to the overarching plot later on. Perhaps in the end, it's not up to us as outsiders to save it, but the very people themselves. I mean, now that I think about it, this has actually been a major factor in pretty much every arc. My memory is a bit hazy on Mondstadt, so I don't want to say anything wrong there. But in Viewe, the whole theme was around humanity's persistence and their own need to step up and take control of their lives in the absence of their Archon. This is no more apparent than in Shen He's Archon quest, where it came down to the people alone to protect their nation. Inazuma, on the other hand, was about how humans' desire for freedom and autonomy could never be shackled away for eternity, which led to our whole final confrontation with A, in which we basically had a power of friendship moment to stop her. There will always be those who dare to break the lightning's glow. In that scenario, it was the wishes and the futures of the people that gave us the strength to win. But anyway, I'm getting a little sidetracked here, you guys get the point. Nahida saves Sumeru, the people of Fontaine and Farina prevent the prophecy's worst case scenario, and etc. So back to the Simulanka, we know from Alice that the fate's been pulling some serious strings here, calling up the Traveler, Wanderer, Kirara, Navia, and Nilu to this world. All of them were just chilling, reading what they thought was a fairy tale book before getting yanked here. Much like how our twin ended up in Tavad because the heavens answered their call. Now for everyone else that was summoned, they all had their own callings. Navia was the king, Nilu was the fairy, Kirara was the puss in boots, and Wander, well obviously was the hero. And we were, well, like always, just the traveler, here to bear witness to it all. And like always, nothing is unintentional. I'm sure that Alice brought us here for a reason, and a big part of that was to prepare for the future and learn from this experience. So think about it. What if our siblings started out with the same role we've got now? Just another witness in the grand scheme of things. 
They were likely tagging along with one of the other Descenders who was supposed to be the hero of the story. But then, more well, plot twist, the Descender bites the dust and our siblings left holding the bag. On their journey, they failed. And so they were forced to carry the burden and become the hero themselves. But here is where things get interesting. If they're playing the hero now, we're the ones watching their legendary feats unfold. Maybe we're meant to break this cycle and finally witness the hero save Tavat and complete their mission, even if it means they go down with the ship. Maybe that's why our siblings first run failed. They tried to play the hero and mess with the natural order of things. But this time, we will be the true witness instead of the hero, just as Simulanka foreshadows. Now that doesn't mean we won't do anything and just watch, and all the other arcs we still played an active role and served as the catalyst for things to work out properly, but in the end, the deciding factor will always come down to the inhabitants of the world. Now something I neglected to mention before was just why I loved Wander and Minnie Durin's relationship to begin with. The funny and awkward banter aside, they pretty much shove it down your throat that they're two sides of the same coin. Both were betrayed and mistreated, both of them were lost and cast aside, but most of all, most of all, both of them yearned for that human connection that they were never able to hold on to. But the thing I loved most about it was how Wanderer decided to become Durin's guiding light. Because in his own life, he had none. In the same way that Nahida helped him find the right path and learn that suicide is never the correct choice or decision, he's taking on that same role and applying what he's learned to Durin. It's just a great portrayal of his progression as a character and a great showcase of who Wander is at his core. Now it's not all sunshine and rainbows, we're like well into this review now and I haven't criticized anything yet. So the first thing I want to touch on is the environment design. Now don't fucking flame me here. I'm a firm believer that Genshin's art direction and environment design is top tier and rivals even the likes of From Software in my opinion. But in the Simulanka, well, don't get me wrong, it's still amazing with some pretty cool highlights, but it didn't really set a new standard or anything, if you know what I mean. I just feel like there was a lot more they could have done with the whole origami stuff. But my biggest criticism, however, and the only thing that's really, really holding this event back for me is the main cast. So, for example, in the second Golden Archipelago, which in my opinion is still the best summer event, it held lots of development for the main cast and actually gave them a purpose that couldn't be replaced without changing the whole narrative. Now, I'm not insinuating that all the cast needed was more development because, well, I mean, going into this, half of them were already fully fleshed out characters, but the roles aside from Wanderer could honestly be replaced by, I don't know, pretty much anyone. Like, I don't see a specific reason that Nilu was chosen as the fairy and not someone else. And yeah, I get it, it was kind of supposed to be random, but there's also a fade in all that, so I don't know, was it really? Maybe there's a bigger reason we're not seeing right now, but, you know, I can only judge as is. So if you're not going to give these characters any sort of development, I would have hoped for there to be some sort of chemistry between the group, but unfortunately I wasn't really feeling it. They basically felt like the last students to form a group when your teacher asked people to get into teams with people you never really worked with. That's kind of what it felt like to me. But yeah, uh, overall I give this event like a 7.5 out of 10. I think it was a really good summer event that was unfortunately held down by the main cast, but overall I loved what they did with Wander and Durin and the Hex and Circle stuff was really cool. But other than that, it was nothing crazy aside from the foreshadowing at the very end. But yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say about this event. Again, sorry it took so long to get out. But yeah, if you disliked the video, don't forget to dislike it, subscribe if you think Genshin is a shit game, and yeah, I'll catch you all in the next one. See ya!